I have the uh, privilege and the honor to be able to introduce a special guest speaker today and our special guest. Um, Dr. Balcom, I remember uh, back when I was living in Texas, uh, he came to the uh, place where we were living. And at that time, I was really interested in uh, health. And I was really interested in maybe making a, a national ministry in our church to promote better health for our members. And so we, we were in the car for some reason and we're talking about it. And I was like, sharing with him my idea. And then, you know, of course, he was, he was like, yeah, you know, that's a, that's a great idea. We could all use, you know, better health, lose a little bit of weight. But you know what, you know, our movement really, re really needs right now is young pastors. And then, of course, at that time, I was like, oh, that's, that's good. Someone's, cause someone should fill those shoes. <laughs> um, and that was way before at the time where I was actually thinking, or we were thinking that that's something that we would actually do. But, you know, maybe Dr. Balcom planted the seed a little bit there, and uh, it led to us, you know, being here today. So maybe Dr. Balcom is to thank for us being here. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but... Uh, Anyway, really grateful to have Dr. Balcom and Mrs. Balcom here with us. Um, we had a really wonderful dinner last night, and um, uh, I'm uh, just really grateful that they took the time out of their busy schedule trying to, you know, you know our, 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 our church is, you know, international, right? So we have, you know, headquarters in New York and Korea, and we've got, you know, branches in many, many different countries. And, of course, somebody has to take care of those uh, communities and, and Dr. and Mrs. Balcom really try hard to be the leaders uh, for our national church and I'm sure many times they feel like they don't do enough um, you know, many times they're not the perfect people to do this job but uh, I think that they'd give their best and, um, and I really appreciate that they took the time to come here really with the heart to serve us I, they don't let me pay for anything I tried, to, I tried to pay for breakfast yesterday, I tried to pay for lunch yesterday, and every time Dr. Bell was, no, 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 no. And, um, you know, I really feel like they came here with the heart, not to tell us that we need to do things a certain way or anything like that, but just to come and, and, and see how things are and, you know, and uh, just be here as a support. So I'm really grateful for them. And, you know, Dr. Balcom is going to give a, a message this morning. So, um, and we're so grateful all of you came here to listen. So uh, before I invite him up, I'm going to offer a prayer. So please join me in prayer. Let's give a round of applause and join. Welcome, Dr. Balcom. And this is Balcom. everybody. Once I get started, I can't stop, so I want to give Fumiko the first word. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I think uh, Father matched so good. He's a uh, really speaker, and I'm not a speaker. And um, <clears throat> I, I think uh, we all have something uh, personally. But uh, um, before God to really speak to you anything, put the, our personal things on the side and uh, empty ourselves and uh, welcome some words that uh, God tried to speak to you this morning. And uh, I feel so much blessed to be here. Uh, nature is so beautiful and uh, I feel so much energy from the brothers and sisters and a uh, few people Actually, maybe will show us that the uh, love of this community and uh, Colorado and Denver. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Well, everyone's sitting so far towards the back. You know, I change my shirt every month, whether it needs it or not. So I want to encourage you to come and sit a little. At least that back row hiding out there, the Fleischer pew is right at the back. And Fleischers, please come here near the front. I have need of your things. So, morning, everybody. Uh, bonjour à tous les francophones. Et merci bien pour votre travail. C'est pas difficile. Bonjour. 
I'd like to share two stories with you today. One of them is one you've heard many times, and it's about Jesus, I think. And the second one is one you may not have heard so often, which is about our true Father. And if you can remember these two stories, then my sermon will have been effective. Now, I used to let communities book my flight out of town, but when they realized how long I liked to speak, they would book that flight earlier and earlier, you know, from 4 o'clock to 2 o'clock to 12 o'clock, and pretty soon there was no time to even give the service. So don't worry, I promise not to go on longer than three hours <laughs> or even 30 minutes. If you have a Bible in front of you in the pew, I'd like you to take it out and uh, turn it, if you would, to the book of Matthew, chapter 14. And reading from verse 22. By the way, if you think you're pretty good at reading the Bible and you have one in front of you and you'd like to help me with this reading, could you stand up? You've got a Bible in front of you. You know how to read. Okay, Shirley's up. That's one. Who else? You need at least three people. Okay, yep, yeah, please stand up. Alice? And who else? Chapter 14 and verse 22. Joe, are you going to stand up and do the honors here? All right, we need one more, two more. All right. Okay, so I'm going to point to you. So we're going to read the story of Jesus walks on the water, and we're going to start on this side with number 24, because that's closest to Matthew 22. So read like two verses, and I'll tell you when to stop. Everyone else, pay close attention. Uh, yeah, immediately. by the waves because the wind was against it. Okay, next. During the fourth watch of the... Oh, sorry. 22, 25. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking in the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Shirley? Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Okay, next. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore this thou, why did you have doubt? Okay, and next. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. All right, thank you. Let's give a hand to all of our readers. I kind of feel far up, way up there, so I'm going to come down here. So that was a very busy day in the life and ministry of Jesus. You know, I always thought walking on water, that would be kind of a good day's work. Uh, but it turned out that that particular day was one of the most longest and grueling in Jesus' ministry. It began that morning with the feeding of the 5,000, another very well-known story of Jesus' life and ministry. Uh, I never take for granted that people have read the Gospels lately, so we'll just refresh ourselves. This was in the period of Jesus' ministry, which is sometimes called the Galilean Spring. It was like in the first year, year and a half, and Jesus was still 
attracting big crowds. Uh, they heard that he was coming out to preach. They knew it was something different. And so a lot of people would come to hear him. And to be honest, they also were hoping that they might see a miracle or two. Plus, there was a reputation that if you went to hear Jesus speak, you wouldn't leave hungry. You'd get something to eat. So that particular day, and this story is in three of the Gospels. It's in the book of Matthew, and it's also in Mark and John, but not in Luke. So that particular day began with Jesus giving Sunday service, so to speak. A long one. And as he spoke, the crowds began to get larger and larger until finally the Gospels say there were around 5,000 people gathered. That's a big crowd. And what's very interesting is that the Gospels take time to talk about the disciples. You know, have you ever thought how difficult it might be to be a disciple of Jesus? Because you never really know what's going to happen, right? There's no kind of start time and finish time. You don't really know what Jesus is going to say. Quite often, Jesus would say something that would get everybody upset, and the crowd might turn ugly. I, I often wonder, what would have happened if I'd have been one of Jesus' disciples? You know, I'd, I'm a kind of detail kind of guy. I'd probably be looking at my watch and think, hey, this is pretty going good. You know, we haven't upset anybody so far, and uh, crowd numbers are pretty good. But on this particular day, the crowd continued to gather. And according to the Gospel of John, at one point, the people were so inspired, they decided, Jesus, you are the prophet. We are going to make you king right now. Now, you might think, What's so bad about that? I thought Jesus came to be king of Israel, and he did. But, you know, there was a certain danger in suddenly having a group of people announce you to be the king. The authorities, the Roman authorities, weren't too keen on that. So you can imagine there was always a need to kind of keep the inspiration to an acceptable level. I'm gonna, I probably won't have any difficulty doing that here this morning, right? But, you know. In my wild dreams, I give such a successful sermon that everyone rushes out of the church and starts knocking on doors and, you know, telling people to come here, and pretty soon the police get called because, you know, it's like uncontrollable. So on this day, uh, Jesus has been preaching a long time, three, four, five hours, let's say. And the disciples do not say to Jesus, this is going great. You know, people are really listening to your sermon, and they're so inspired According to the Gospels, they say, this is right before the water story. Uh, you know, it's getting late. Uh, you know, the day's almost over. These people don't have any food. Send them away. You know, let's wrap this up now. You know, it's been a good day, but let's not overdo it. So this is kind of the tension building between Jesus and his disciples. Actually, he's quite short with them. He tells them, okay, you feed them. Anyway, that's another story. We won't go into the feeding of the 5,000. But that's the background, right? So it's a day. You know, imagine now it's 11 o'clock. Imagine and I've spoken until about 4 p.m. And then I tell you that the main sermon is about to begin. You're probably feeling a little nervous and antsy, right? Definitely David. He's already checking his watch. So here's what happens. Uh, Jesus decides he needs some time alone. And he quietly goes away and goes up a mountain to pray by himself and sends the disciples on across the Sea of Galilee to go back home to Capernaum, where they lived at the time. Anyone here actually had a chance to sail on the Sea of Galilee? A few. It's not so big. It's a few miles across, but you can always see the other shore. And... Uh, that's when this story takes place. And I, I think we need some live action to show how it must have been. So I need 12 volunteers to be the disciples of Jesus. These four ladies here, the three, where's the where's number four gone? Okay, you've volunteered. Please come up on the stage. Who else thinks they can do a credible job of looking terrified in a storm? 
Any age is welcome. You just have to not be shy. Okay, come on up. How about you young fellows here? Do you think you could be terrified in a storm? Okay, come up on the stage here. Stand near the front. How many have we got? Count these disciples. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, six. No volunteers? Seven, eight. Okay. Yeah, it was hard for Jesus to get disciples, too. <laughs> How about a jury row volunteer? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, you can be a volunteer. Okay. Okay. Only 12. How many have we got? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Actually, we need 11 because I'm going to be Peter. Is there 12 already? No, no, no. I, I have need of you. Come over here. He is going to be Jesus. I knew I put this shirt on. <laughs> A pretty poor representation, I know, but you have to work with what you've got. So, Jesus, if you would stand over here, just a moment, please. Okay. Now, you guys, you have work to do as well. You are going to be the storm and the waves. So I need you to do some... <laughs> and you guys have to look terrified, remember? Okay, let's see how this goes. Okay, storm and waves. Terrified. Come on, more storm and waves. Come on, this is pathetic. <laughs> terrified, terrified. Terrified. All right. Okay. Not only terrified, but irritated as well. You're probably thinking to yourselves, why are we out on this boat in the middle of the night? I mean, this is Colorado, right? Did you ever go out driving and the weather turned bad on you in the mountains? You probably did, right? And did you ever get to the point where you feel, you know, this might not actually work out so well? You know, I might be stuck here for days. So that's how the disciples are, are feeling, right? They've had this long day. They could have just stayed where they were, but they got on the boat. It's far out at sea, and there's a storm. Storm? And they're terrified. And suddenly, they see a, a guy walking on the water, and they get even more frightened. It's a ghost. More storm. Okay, stop there, Jesus. That's good. And suddenly, to make matters really worse, the captain, that's me, Peter, decides to call out. You know, usually if you see a ghost, you don't want to be drawing attention to yourself, right? So I say, who is it? to you tell me to come out there and walk on the water oh peter don't you recognize my shirt yeah you it's pretty ugly <laughs> okay i think it's peter i'm gonna go out there and walk on the water and leave you guys to yourselves Does that sound like a good idea Does that sound like a good idea? be careful no. No. no certainly not no no, no. yes good <laughs> No. Possibly, right? So they're kind of thinking to themselves, man, could this get any worse? You know, Jesus has disappeared. There's this ghost out there on the water. That couldn't possibly be Jesus. Nobody can walk water. And now Peter is deciding he's going to step out there and leave us in the boat. And there's a storm. And we're scared. 
But Peter steps out. Pretty surprising, right? But then Peter gets frightened by the storm. And he starts to sink. Jesus is still there, close. But he's sinking. And Peter has three choices. One choice is to get back on the boat with these guys who are frightened and also angry with me and complaining, that idiot. <laughs> or maybe I can swim. You know, I'm a pretty good swimmer. I was a fisherman. I can tread water. But, you know, if you tread water in a storm, usually you have about 10 or 15 minutes and you're gone. Or my third choice, I can do what Peter did. And he called out the world's shortest prayer. Lord, save me! And? Peter, you haven't been going to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was one thing he said. He actually said, you have little faith. Oh, you have little faith. <laughs> Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Look and he took him back in the boat, <laughs> and the storm went down. Okay, at least you laughed. <laughs> More time in the gym. Okay, let's give a round of applause to the disciples. And Jesus, you may depart. Okay. Some people are looking very strangely. This guy's the president. They must really have been scraping the barrel when they picked him. Like, you know, can't even give a proper sermon. Okay. I did actually go to seminary. And when you go to seminary, you study all these types of stories. And there's all kinds of forms of intellectual explanation that people come up with. And all of what I'm about to tell you is true. So one explanation actually advanced by Albert Schweitzer, the great hero who worked to cure leprosy, was that Jesus was not actually walking on the water at all, but he was walking on the shore. And the disciples were closer to the shore than they thought they were, so Jesus not really walking on the water, he's walking on the shore. On a scale of zero, totally lame, to ten brilliant, how would you rate that explanation? It's kind of down in the totally lame, right? Then there's another group who think that actually Jesus was walking in the surf, you know, kind of like Rip Warren, Purpose Driven Church. He's out there in the surf. Also pretty lame. Again, perfectly true. People who went to school for many years came up with this, this explanation. And another explanation is Jesus was walking on a thin sheet of ice floating on the Sea of Galilee. Um, well, if you've been to Israel, you'll know that ice on the Sea of Galilee, that's not really that likely. It's pretty warm. It's not totally impossible, but you can imagine. And then there's another group that think it wasn't really Jesus at all, but he was like an Indian mystic projecting an image of himself out there on the ocean. And there are many things like that. But what I want to ask you the question this morning is, what is this story really about? Anyway, what's it really about? Is it really about Jesus at all? What do you think? It's about faith, yes. So is it really about Jesus? In a way, but I don't think Jesus is the main character in this story, right? I mean, Jesus did lots of miracles in the Bible, the detail and catalog. So how many people think it's about Jesus? It's okay. One. There's no wrong answer, although I know who you are. <laughs> How many people think it's about Peter? Okay. My understanding, it's not about Peter either. It's about those guys in the boat, stuck in the middle position. They love Jesus. They followed him. But when it gets down to really a time of difficulty and danger, they're not actually sure what to do anymore. Peter, at least, knew what to do. I mean, if the story has any truth in it or not, I don't know.
But I do know, I've always thought I would like to be like Peter, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like to be the one, Roger, who said, if it's me, call me out there, and he walks. Even if you sink, it's a great story. But I don't think this story is about Peter either. I think it's about the people muttering and complaining on the boat. Jesus and Peter, we'll call them the water walkers. And those guys are the boat talkers, the ones who sit back and talk, but they don't walk. They don't have it in them to get out and really take the walk of faith. And that's actually 11 out of 12. It's not like 50-50, you know, some people have it and others don't. In reality, most of us, I think, and I'll count myself in this group, even though right now I'm walking on the water right here, my big challenge, my big challenge is, am I ready to step out and walk in faith, even though things, honestly speaking, sometimes don't look too good? I mean, after all, for the disciples, they relied on Jesus a lot. He called the shots. He set the agenda. He told them when they were going to this city or that city. He worked miracles. He always had something to say. They never saw Jesus defeated in an argument or at a loss for words. Never saw him defeated by the situation. He was amazing. But what they perhaps didn't realize is that his hope was that they would become amazing too. That they would have the same measure of faith and belief that Jesus had. You know, there's two understandings of what it means to be a Messiah. One is, the Messiah is unique. Nobody else like him ever. He's one of a kind. And God sends the Messiah to save the rest of the world from sin and death. And that's true. But it's not the divine principle understanding of what a Messiah is. In our understanding, the Messiah is a model. He's an example for every man and every woman, too, to become just like. The Messiah comes as the first among many, the one who shows what God expects and believes we can do. But that's tough for us to understand because, honestly speaking, it's a little more comfortable to think the Messiah is up there, I'm down here, and really, God doesn't expect so much from me. But I wanted to share with you this morning, that is not true. God expects from each of us, everyone here in the audience, old, young, man, woman, to be a Messiah. That's why True Father, when he came to give us his last will and testament, told us you are Tribal Messiahs, if you're not familiar with that term, it simply means that God is anointing you to go and save people in your own family, your own tribe, your neighborhood, the people you work with. And some people say, well, that's kind of conditional, but I'm not really a tribal Messiah unless I do X, Y, Z, you know, and this and that, but that's also not the right understanding. You already are, in God's eyes, equipped to be a Messiah, a person who can save. Why? Because God has trusted you with his tremendous truth of the principle. God has already told you about the life and mission of true parents. Or you're here right now to learn about it. In God's eyes, we already have that qualification. But we don't recognize it. We don't use it. We keep thinking there's something else to come but we already have it. Of course, I'm not suggesting that it's okay to just relax and think, okay, I'm, I've done it already. No, that's not my point. My point is we have enough to start that walk. We don't need to stay on the boat wondering if there's something else or something new or some other message. No, we're already on the boat. It's time to get off and start walking in the confidence that God will guide us and help us to build his kingdom. Yeah, I, I, our movement is very small. This church is pretty small. Denver's pretty big, right? A few million people, something like that. So if God's plan is simply to wait for everyone here to start feeling ready and capable, we've got a long way ahead of us. But I think God's plan is already, right now, today, you have enough to get started. 
And that what we need to do is pluck up the faith and the courage to get off the boat and start walking. Now, it's difficult if it's just one person, right? For Peter, imagine how it might have been if all the disciples had said, yeah, we believe in Jesus. What if they'd all got off the boat together and made the same commitment to start walking the walk? I think that things might have turned out a lot differently. I don't think Jesus would have been saying, you of little faith. I think he would have been overwhelmed with pleasure, with encouragement, with gratitude. Wow, look at that. All of them are ready even to risk death to follow my example. But there was only one, and he gave up. I think he wouldn't have given up if the other 11 had backed him up. So I want to ask for you. I mean, maybe in a church here we have Michael. He might be our Peter or Jesus. And I know he's trying his best to step out in faith every day. But it's tough. It's not easy to be a pastor, actually. So what about the rest of us? Are we going to be water walkers or boat talkers? You know, It's an important decision. Actually, the future of our movement in Denver depends on your choice. Of course, I said the same thing in Dallas a couple of weeks ago and so forth. But it's true everywhere. It's the regular people, the regular members, you, who will make the choice that decides whether or not this vision of true parents, this task, is going to be fulfilled or not. It's, it's really up to us. So one more thing I want to share with you. I promised to tell you a story of true parents. And that, that question is, you may think... I think because I thought, you know, you've forgotten something. I'm just an ordinary guy or girl. I'm not so special. I wasn't called specially by God. Actually, that's not true. You were. But you might think that way. And I know when I look inside my heart and mind that I'm not ready yet. So call me again when I'm ready. That's one point of view. The other is, I'll be ready by action. I'm going to start now, and my commitment, my faith is going to help me to be ready and prepared. So let me ask you, for Father himself, right up there, you know, when he received his commission from Jesus, do you think that in the very next day he felt ready to go out and do it? No, right? I did. I was so stupid. I thought, wow, you know, if you have an encounter with Jesus and he tells you you are his successor, what more do you need? You know, surely you're ready to go. That was a pretty shallow understanding. And then I thought, well, okay, but surely, you know, Father and Jesus, they just had daily communication and before long, maybe a week or two, they were tight and everything was good to go. But I've been reading again something of what Father said about his experiences after he met Jesus. If you haven't heard about the story of Reverend Moon meeting Jesus yet, it's a great story. You should follow up on it. Turns out that there were many more days where the whole thing seemed like just a dream. There were many days when Father Moon thought he understood something from God and then he realized he was totally wrong, utterly wrong. In fact, he says, it took eight and a half years, eight and a half years to even begin to feel he was on the right track. If you look in the back of the room there, there's a divine principle, just one. I think it has. Gilo, could you just check how many pages there are in the divine principle for me? 420. Roger says 420. He's probably right. 536. Okay, let's go with 536. And according to the autobiography of Father Moon, it took him nine and a half years to reach the point where he felt he was ready to start. So in my immaturity, I thought, okay, nine and a half years, four, five, 535 pages. That's like 50 pages a year, right? That's like one page a week. Well, that's pretty slow going. But I, I guess, you know, if every week once you felt you had a, 
a nugget of truth from God, you, you could go with that. But it wasn't like that. There were eight years where there was really nothing at all. I find that hard to believe, except when I think of my own experiences, struggling sometimes to understand what God really wants and, and hearing nothing. Any of you had that experience? You pour out your heart, you pray hard, you study, nothing. Father had that experience, but he didn't give up. That was the key thing. He didn't give up, and one day he said, it was as if God had turned on a movie projector, and I began to see the whole history of humanity from the fall of man until today, and for the first time I understood the heart of God through all these years, and I couldn't stop it. After eight and a half years of nothing, the revelation and the inspiration kept multiplying and coming, and it, it couldn't be stopped. So we need to have that kind of experience, right? Even if you've been a member of this church for five months or five years or 50 years, you want to have that kind of experience where the inspiration and power of God is coming like a fire hose into your life and it can't be stopped. That's what God wants for all of us. And you don't need to feel too worried if it hasn't happened yet. Because for Father also, it was a long and difficult course. And then the day will come when it happens to you and you feel at home in the presence of God. But before that, let me share with you this final story by Father of how difficult it is on the way. I love this story. Actually, I have been teaching about it for years, and in the end I thought, I was, maybe I'm making this stuff up. I haven't seen where Father said it. Uh, but here it is in Earthly Life and Spirit World number two. And Father is explaining what it's like to be in the presence of God and not be ready for it. Okay? But it's a, it's a story. One time, many years ago, there was a rich man in Mokpo. That's part of Korea. He was so rich that he owned all the land in the northern area around the city. He was the richest man in Mokpo. Got it so far? One of my friends was going to get married to this man's only daughter and become the son-in-law of this rich family. This was during the Japanese colonial occupation, so almost no one could afford the expense of a modern Western-style wedding with tuxedos and formal gowns. Most of the time, the groom would just wear his military uniform, try to make sure the buttons were fastened properly, and stick a flower on his chest. But the rich man was so rich, and he had all these friends coming from Tokyo and elsewhere, he decided to have a modern-style wedding. And as I was one of the groomsmen, I was asked to be one of the groomsmen, one of four. The bride, too, had four bridesmaids, and so I went. So we got the picture. It's a rich society wedding. There's four groomsmen. There's four bridesmaids, but the family is providing the clothing. So you can imagine how this is going to work out. For the girls, it really wasn't so much of a problem because if you know anything about Korean clothes, they're kind of flowing and generous, and so... The girls could all fit into their bridesmaids' dresses, and it was no problem. But Father said, well, when the bride's family prepared the outfits for the groomsmen, they figured they could make them all the same height of the groom. And that included the outfit I was going to wear, the suit. In fact, the groom was the same height as me, but his body wasn't nearly as plump as mine. He was built really flat, like a piece of plywood. I mean, he was really thin from front to back, and I was not. I, I love Father when he talks like this. You know, I'm not the thinnest guy in the world myself. So now you can imagine Father's predicament. When I put on the white shirt they bought for me for the wedding and buttoned it up, you could still see my belly button. And when I put on the suit, it was so small it spread apart like this. And the shirt stuck out like this. It was such incredible hell for me to have to wear those clothes. 
I still haven't forgotten how terrible it was. I think it was an important lesson for me so that I could know how important it is in the terms of the course of restoring God's will that I could fit in when I go to the spirit world. I had to stand in front of this huge crowd. Here was the groomsman dressed like this in front of a crowd of thousands of people, including anybody who was anybody in South Chola province. It was so terrible. I still want to cry out whenever I think about it. I would much rather have found a rat hole somewhere so that I could crawl into. It was all I could stay to do there in my place and endure. And Father went on. You know, it's a wedding, so pretty soon out came the food. But he was so tight and trussed up in this suit and, and, and shirt that he couldn't eat a bite. It was already like the maximum situation. And then it came time for dancing. <laughs> dancing, you kidding? The whole thing. But there he was. It was the event that everybody wanted to be at. To score an invitation to that wedding was the most valuable thing. But Father wasn't ready. He was dressed in a way that was so uncomfortable. And when he thought about it afterwards, he thought, that must be what it's like if you're invited to go and live with God in heaven and you're not ready. You'll be trussed up can't move, uncomfortable, and there'll be nothing more that you want to do than to run away. I don't want that for you. I don't want it for me. The point is, how do we get ready? How do we get ready so that we can live in comfort in the presence of God? That's what it's all about, right? From the very beginning, all God ever wanted was to live with His children in comfort. So the clothes fit. And you don't feel you want to crawl into a rat hole and die. So Father had that experience himself. I, I mention it to you because I'm giving you a big challenge today, I hope. And that challenge is to believe you already have what it takes to be a Messiah, a difference maker, a change maker here in the city of Denver. There are enough people in this room this morning to transform this city more than enough. But is there enough faith? Is there enough confidence that if we work together, we can get this job done? If you let Michael be the only one walking out on the water, for sure he's going to sink. But if you can back him up and walk with him and really commit to what it might take to change this city, the, the victory is already won. And by doing it, you will transform yourself. We will transform ourselves so that we fit comfortably into the presence of God. I want to see true parents in Denver. I want to see this city being the holy seat of God, the place where God feels comfortable to live in every family, in every community. I really believe it's in our hands. Yeah, I know that our movement is not the biggest, but God told me it's big enough if your faith is big enough. And if it's, your faith is big enough, anything is possible. I think that's really all I wanted to say this morning. I already preached longer than I said I would. Fumiko's giving me the evil eye. So let me pray to conclude.